Have you ever realized that why concrete and steel are used in construction? Well, yes, apart from the theory of strain compatibility, it's the uniqueness of the bond between concrete and steel. Why do I call it unique? For that, you have to see this video on bond strength and slip between concrete and steel. Well, bond behavior of concrete and steel can be known by applying a pullout load on the steel bar, which is embedded in concrete. A pullout load leads to the development of stresses in steel bars. The steel bars have ribs and these start bearing on surrounding concrete due to the action of the pull. The green colored stresses in the figure adjoining concrete can be seen. These are the restraining forces acting from concrete on ribs and the forces are compressive. One of the components of forces in surrounding concrete is black arrowed tension. These act circumferentially leading to fracture once tensile stresses exceed tensile strength of concrete. This is the interlocking force and there is a development of subsequent restraining force from concrete on steel. The other forces that act during a bond addition are chemical addition and friction. One is a chemical force and the other is a physical one. So the failures that occur when the bond is lost between concrete and steel one of them is when the circumferential tension force exceeds the tensile strength of concrete. The splitting force is developed within concrete and this leads to splitting cracks in concrete. Two or three angled cracks may be visible around the bars embedded in concrete. Accompanied by cracking or preceding cracking, a slip may occur by loss of addition and friction between concrete and steel. The steel bars slip over a particular slip length. Thereby, what is bond strength? It is a force FTX which is maximum bond resistance to large slip and to splitting failure. A force FTX is equal to A into tau T, A being the contact area, a product of U and L. Now here U, L are U is the perimeter of steel which is in contact with concrete and L is the length of steel bars in contact with concrete. Now tau T is the bond, bond stress between steel and concrete. The initial stresses develop on account of resistance due to addition between concrete and steel. This value is 0 0.03 megapascal to around 1 megapascal. A bond slip would only start once initial bond stresses are developed and addition is lost. The steel bars undergo friction bond stresses due to interlocking and friction resistance development. The slip during this phase is small. Once maximum bond stresses develop and all further resistance is lost, bond slip occurs. A subsequent splitting may also occur in concrete. This is more predominant when concrete grade is less. Beautiful representation of buildup of bond stresses on application of pullout load can be seen here. The value of bond stress is more in rib bars ranging around 10 to 12 megapascals. For a general 12 mm bar, the bond slip can be as high as 28 to 30 mm in rib bars before failure initiates. However, there are many more questions that must have arised in your mind by now. First, what is the difference between anchor bond or is it the same? A simple answer to this is anchor is nothing different for, from bonding steel in concrete. A proper anchor would mean something that does not split on pulling. So anchoring requires a perfect bond with utmost interlocking. This could be achieved by providing grips, fastening, increasing the length of contact between steel and concrete. Next comes the question of what is the difference between bond under compression and tension. Answer to this is given here. When a compressive force acts on concrete, a lateral pressure develops on confining steel bars and on the longitudinal steel bars. A lateral buckling may also be initiated. So the 
black arrow confining forces exert reaction as circumferential compression near the bond on one end and a circumferential tension on other end. A perfect representation of this is a model given by Vivatap Nepata in 1979 wherein he characterized a bond as a compression load applied at bar end and the tension force at the other end of the anchored reinforcing bar. Surely the column was under compression. So a flexural compression zone occurred on the right side of the column face and a flexural tension zone on the left hand side. So in compression, concrete cover is the first to crack. The bond stresses are moreover perpendicular to the plane of flooring. If we compare this to tension pull-out forces discussed earlier, this means that the development of bond stresses is the the development of bond stresses is the same philosophy. Only the supporting features vary in loading in compression and tension, like the example of confining pressure in the compression loading. Another inquiry would be what happens to the bond when there is no monotonic but some cyclic loading acting on a bar in concrete. The work of Elige Hazen et al. in 1983 is a perfect representation of the difference between monotonic loading and a cyclic loading. It was observed a failure envelope for the reversal stresses occurs at lower bond stresses as compared to monotonic loading. Thereby, under loads like earthquake, which are reversal cyclic, bond strength decreases in between concrete and steel. Another beautiful explanation at the microstructure level of the bond between concrete and steel is seen here. The aggregate interlocks the steel, ribs, and this develops shear resistance. Termed as ITZ, interstitial zone, aggregate interlocking, this is believed to be the major cause for the bond development between concrete and steel. A loss of anchorage occurs at the local level with a slip representation given, given as the breaking of the interlocking pattern as shown here in the figure. The bond behavior is crucial for concrete. How? The reinforced concrete seems to bond with itself because there is a wonderful compatibility between steel and concrete. Thereby, if the concrete has to sustain, the bond should remain over time, resisting corrosion, fire and elevated temperature. Finally, if the bond is the bond same as development length and the answer is no, the development length is provided as an anchorage to steel in concrete. However, one form of anchoring is the bond between steel and concrete.